The World Cup begins today, so of course I've got an idea to completely change one of the most fundamental things about international basketball. Hello, Emmett Ryan here, and how is everyone today? It is World Cup opening day today, this is going out. I'm recording this actually two days before the tournament starts, so no doubt something incredible is going to happen in that. The reason we're recording so close to the tournament is because well, I still have to finish up stuff in my regular job, my day job. Yes, I know, ball in your business, my day job before I go, and I need to set aside time for that. But also, I got a lot of organizing and packing to do here before I go to Manila, so there's a lot to do. But essentially, I'm going to talk today about a change in the naturalized player rule, which I'd like to see done. One I think would benefit the sport. Uh, inspired a lot, actually, by reactions to my Jordan Clarkson video by my fans in the Philippines. Well, fans, sorry, by viewers in the Philippines. I would say I'd love to have fans. I don't really. I like to have people I get on with, you know? Uh, fans, I feel I let them down. People, ah, sure, they're used to me. So, we're going to break this down in three simple plan pl planks. First is what the change I would propose would be. Second is why FIBA and the NBA would do it. And the third is what we would actually do about the current naturalization rule, because that is something that still exists. So, let's get to it with part one. So it's a pretty simple approach. It is adopting the format of football. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's quite simple really. If you are eligible for a passport in your in a country under traditional rules, and I'll get to what those that are in a second, you are eligible and you get the passport. You actually have to actually get the passport, just to be clear, then you are eligible for that passport. So what is eligibility? One being born there. So even though not every country has birthright citizenship in the eyes of this rule that I'm proposing, if you're born there, you are eligible to play there. Birthright just automatically goes in. The other is if your parents are born there or if your grandparents are born there, this includes step by the way, because football used to not allow step grandparents or step parents, a step, totally fine. Uh, like obviously likewise uh, adopted and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Notice I didn't say great-grandparents. Big, big thing on that. The other thing I would do is introduce a five-year residency rule. So, discussed residency rules before years ago with uh, Oz Davis, former uh, doyen of Ball in Europe, and the great David Hine, who I'm looking forward to seeing in Manila. But uh, they were suggesting, what if he made them live there a year or three years? I said, no, rugby's three years. That still feels short to me. One year is really nothing. Five years is about commitment. Like five years in a country, it's like a reward for like putting the work in to be part of that community. And you know, it's a, it's a commitment on the player. So it shows that a player who is willing to change nationality has put that commitment in. And yeah, so I think five years automatically, it's also good for the clubs in that front, by the way. Uh, but uh, why, uh, why would I do this? Well, quite simple really, uh, it's that, FIBA's efforts right now to avoid a Wild West are a bit too limiting. So what would there be with a Wild West? Well, so the classic one is Israel, uh, you know, great basketball nation. They could, under their very, very much within their rights, passport rules say, well, anybody who is eligible for an Israeli passport, typically anybody Jewish or of Jewish heritage, you know, should be able to pay for Israel. Now, Israeli basketball would immediately kind of go Right, that could get a bit wacky very, very fast. So they probably put a bit of a clamp down on that. But the point being that they would obviously kind of go, well, maybe this is a bit iffy, you know? So even a country who would benefit from it would immediately go, listen, lads, maybe not. So when you've got that going on, it's obvious. But also some countries might just take abuse of it because obviously not every country has the same rules around passports. So you need a universal rule for a sport so that every nation competing in the world will be impacted the same way. And yeah, like to me, it's pretty straightforward. We're adapting largely simple and accepted principles that are used in uh, the world's biggest sport, pretty much. And just kind of going, let's apply those to international basketball because international football does pretty well. It benefits a lot from that aspect as well. And you have more competitive nations at large, not necessarily competing for the title, but certainly in terms of, you know, being able to make deep runs, being able to qualify, you've got more countries in those conversations. And a lot of that is down to the respect for the diaspora nature of uh, communities and sport. Like, and 
I think that that's a lot to go for it and certain countries would obviously benefit. I'm deliberately wearing a green shirt today. Uh, it's actually not a basketball one. It's uh, from the college football classic, uh, which is on this weekend in Dublin, by the way. Um, but um, I would tell be going to before I fly to Manila. And Ireland would obviously benefit straight away. There's no question. Like Pat Connaughton, for example, is eligible to play for Ireland under the, under the current rules, but only as a naturalized player, even though by normal standards, he is con uh, he's an Irish citizen and considered no different an Irish citizen in every walk of life but basketball to me which is kind of wild when you think about it uh, there's other players who fit that description and the current FIBA rule by the way for those of you who don't know is you have to get the passport of whatever nation or nations you would consider representing before you turn 16 and actually for one country in particular which comes immediately to mind which isn't known as a basketball power that's a huge thing because India is a great example. India is a one passport nation. If you hold an Indian passport, you can't hold another one. So naturally, if you're American of Indian heritage, you're going to hold your US passport up until a point, usually much later in life, like an adult, essentially, so over 16, before you would consider adopting an Indian passport. So that's a simple rationale there. So it brings a sort of universality to it without being overly harsh and also shows the importance of communities around the world. Which kind of brings us, kind of, kind of brings us, kind of brings us to point two. So yeah, I think FIBA should love this. The reason is simple. They want more nations being competitive, doing better at basketball. Obviously, homegrown talent is still going to be the driver. And that's very important. But it's still kind of weird when you see somebody with absolutely no ties other than a password they were just given representing a nation international play, which is what the current rule essentially allows. A naturalized player can go in and essentially have not lived a day in the country they're representing, but go play for them. Have no ties as well, so because again, not just about living days, have no cultural ties in any capacity to that country because obviously they want countries to be able to like find that one person who can help. <coughs> great, great. That's good that they want to help grow the sport, but you're going to do more by getting this approach to true naturalization, as I said, like we're five years commitment, or by going at the diaspora communities, because the best players are still gonna play for the best teams, uh, fundamentally speaking. It's only gonna be the, and anybody who doesn't play for, say, the best nation available to them, it's kind of gonna show where they really want to play and where they really love. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's a great thing. It shows culture and heritage. And for a lot of countries right now, they, you know, go morally against even having a single naturalized player, which is totally their right. But I think most of those countries I'm discussing will be fine with going with a player of the heritage and who, you know, as, as in close by heritage in terms of years and generations as well. So I think they buy into it. And what you would essentially see is in the short term, obviously some wild stuff, basically a whole load of Bahamas uh, for those who have been following the Olympic qualifying tournaments. But I don't think you would have that as a long-term thing. What you'd really see is people from those diaspora finding ways they can like build their ties to the nations of their parents and their grandparents and really contribute back to basketball in those countries. Like they might start off only playing the odd game or two or the odd qualification window or three, but like they're gonna form that bond at the home nation, which has adopted them essentially, you know, as one of their own, recognized them as being of their people if they get into it. And I think FIBA is gonna love that. Like that's gonna be great. But not just FIBA, I think the NBA is going to love that because the NBA's biggest thing is growing interest in the NBA around the world. It's the main reason it's got interest in international basketball. So the more of its players who can play internationally, um, and you know this automatically does it, uh, you know, the more interested it is to the NBA because it grows interest in those players because of their natural ties. And you know, for the NBA, that's a simple thing of, well, like we'll suddenly have more people of Irish heritage, of British heritage too, I'll point out. Uh, and of other places, you know, you know, buying in and playing. Like, lots and lots of countries are going to gain from this. Philippines is an obvious one where, again, Jordan Clarkson, under, if he was a football player, would just be considered a regular Filipino. Because as a basketball player, he's considered an import, even though his mother is, from, is Filipina. So, it's very basic stuff like this we're talking, and I think the NBA would love this. Because you can suddenly start to see the NBA show, look, basketball is the global game. Look at these people playing for this multitude of nations and they all play in our league. I think, you know, they've got a lot of that now. They would have a lot more of that if they were to adopt it. So, yeah, I think the FIBA and the NBA would love this. And that leads us to part three, which will actually be our shortest part because it's a pretty simple answer. 
Yeah, I'm just getting rid of it, uh, with one exception, which is grandparenting. So anyone who's currently benefiting from it, at the moment the new rules get brought in, retain the benefit essentially, but they are treated the same way, so there can only be one thereof of them. But uh, that doesn't stop anyone else coming in, so no new naturalised in the old sense, but everybody else is fine. And the simple reason is, I don't want to hurt any players who've currently benefited from it, and I don't want to hurt any players who are on the road to benefiting from it either. So, yeah, simple as that. There's only so many passports to go around, obviously, so I think that'll make players want to make a greater commitment. And there's a simple benefit there. I think it's really simple. We just get rid of the current rule. Uh, it, it served a purpose. I think it's time has passed, and I think there's a better rule that can come in place and replace it. So I'm going to miss days one through three of the Basketball World Cup in terms of in-person. I'll still obviously be watching and following. Although how I'm going to follow on Friday with the clashing directly on my work day. Okay, I'm still going to be watching and following on Saturday. And then Sunday I'm mostly airborne. So I'm going to watch the say two of the World Cup and miss most of days one and three. But I'm there from day four onwards. My first game is going to be Greece versus USA. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of you in Manila. And if you haven't already, please subscribe here. There will be lots of videos coming from my time in Manila. And yeah, it's, it's going to be great. It won't just be me talking at the camera. We're going to get player spots. We're going to, you know, walk around town a bit. Uh, I'm hoping to see the Araneta Coliseum because it was the home of the Thriller in Manila. Yeah, there's a lot to look forward to here. So listen, thank you all for subscribing. Have a great World Cup and uh, see you soon.